I wrote a historical novel. So of course, I'm going to start with a snippet from ancient history. Somewhere in West Asia, sometime between 4000 and 3000 BC, the earliest metal workers discovered bronze. For a few hundred years, for a few thousand years really until then, they already knew how to extract metals, like and tin. But that just wasn't quite enough. And then they figured out how to mix it up in the right proportions and arrive at bronze. Kicking off what could arguably be the most impactful phase in human history. Bronze is harder. It's more ductile. It's better suited for tools like plows, weapons, cooking utensils, artifacts. It revolutionized every civilization that it encountered and accelerated other things like writing, like trade, and so on. Let's look at this metaphorically. Let's absorb bronze metaphorically. We all have a single career, or at least we are encouraged to single-mindedly pursue a career, a career, one passion, one vocation. And anything that distracts us from this, anything else, anything that robs us of this deep focus is considered bad. Would you agree? Yeah. One, one passion. But maybe, just maybe, another exposure is not weakening, but it's strengthening, more healing. It's better than the metal in its purest form. Steve Jobs, a famous advocate for the marriage of technology and arts and humanities, enrolled in Reed's College for calligraphy lessons to learn the subtleties of typography. He said at the time he did not have any hope of a practical application of the skill, not even a hope. Yet, a decade later, it electrified the industry. It all came back to him in the form of bitmap screens that could handle multiple forms. I find this very fascinating. I see this as a great example of an orthogonal interest area that despite its disparity, or, or maybe even because of the disparity, having a huge impact. It made him connect the dots and kick off creativity and, and innovation you know, when I was in high school, career choices were always presented to me as either or. You're a technology person. You're an arts person. You're an economics person. You choose group one or group two or group three. Let's face it. Some of us are very clear as to what we want to be. Astrophysicists, nothing else. Deep sea divers, nothing else. And some of us, not really. I understand from the registration data that many of you here are like I was when I was in high school. Had multiple interests. Multiple interests that I found mentally stimulating. Was it worth pursuing all these things at the same time? Would they ever impact each other? Should they? Do they need to? Escher, a Dutch artist, you might have seen, seen his stunning visuals of you know, those interlocking snakes, of those never-ending staircases. He was trained in drawing and woodcut techniques. But you know what brought on this mesmerizing quality to his drawings? It was his interest in mathematics, in non-Euclidean geometry, and topology. Well, your interest need not be as disparate as art and maths could be maybe as disparate as nursing and statistics. Florence Nightingale, she was a Victorian nurse, very famous for how she tended to the wounded in the Crimean War. The popular culture at the time called her a ministering angel, the lady with the lamp. But what I was not aware of was her interest and her pioneering work in representation of data. You know, you've seen all these 
pie charts and histograms that all these uh, hot big data analytics companies show, she is credited with a particular variation of the pie chart, which she used to represent the data about the wounded in a very powerful manner. I find this um, inspirational, liberating. You know, there I was in high school, a lot of my friends helpfully labeled me as confused. Actually, there was this one neighbor who was very encouraging. She told me, you can learn whatever you want. As long as you lose the glasses, we will find you a bright room. <laughs> so here I am today. I'm a software professional. I love my job. I love the industry. I love what this vibrant industry has brought on. The power and the potential in healthcare, in education, in the jobs it has created. Even if I had a million dollars, I would still want to be part of this industry. I'm also a writer. I write blogs. Occasionally I tweet. And I've also written a historical novel, and I have another one upcoming, another novel based on art. So has it been worthwhile pursuing both of this? Absolutely. You know, so much so that I would now advocate, even if you have one area that you want to focus on, even if you're very clear about what you want to do, it is important to consider another area to spend some time on over a period, consistently. You know, when I read about the 18th century for my book, it helped me understand the market forces in play in the industry, in my industry today. When I worked on my character development, it actually helped me increase my empathy levels, helped me work with my coworkers a little bit better. More surprisingly, my training as a software professional has helped me with my writing. You know, I was able to actually apply some of the software engineering principles to harness my writing creativity. If only I had paid attention to what I knew about technical debts, I would not have wrote, wrote, written myself into those difficult plot challenges. And what I learned about code refactoring came in handy when I was editing my manuscripts. You know, in, in a way, it has actually made me who I am today. It has given me my own unique voice. It has contributed to the best parts of my personality. And what contributes to the worst part of my personality is a whole different talk altogether. But this is all hindsight. So maybe we should go back and look at the years, the couple of decades that I skipped in between and see what I've learned. Right after high school, I went to college. I chose software because that rank has the highest amidst my interests. And I also have always felt that I have a slightly more analytical and logical bent towards things. I got a job with its own quirks, perks, and setbacks. It took on a trajectory of its own. But I would say my primary career, passion, is relatively easy. Writing was not. Difficulty number one, I had a lot of interests and it took me a while not to scatter my energies running after a lot of trivial meaningless pursuits. Malcolm Gladwell says you need 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. 10,000 hours. I mean we're all time starved in this 21st century. Forget 10,000 hours. I don't even think I could give something a thousand hours over a period of time. So how do I follow this? How do I do this? I started thinking about the bronze. You know, they mixed up a few metals, but the catch was a few metals, not a hundred different metals. So I had to kind of understand that I have to balance between being a one-trick pony and a pony that was running after every trick, not learning any. It becomes harder and harder, as we saw, when you have too many balls in the air to juggle. So then, I started winnowing my interests. I started differentiating the one that are passing interests 
and the one that are compelling dreams. And writing slowly started emerging as my compelling dream. You know, maybe if you have a family like mine that feeds you and takes care of you, you could do a few more. And that's how I have time to squeeze in my traveling and my drawing. But those I do when I have the luxury of time. But for writing, I make time. Difficulty number two, nobody cares about your secondary pursuit. There is no reward, no rebuke. There's no teacher who's going to tell you to turn in that paper. There's no promotion if you acquire a skill. Half the time, I didn't know if the skills that I were acquiring is going to be of any use. Well, half the time, I wasn't even sure if I was acquiring any skill. And in fact, it was worse. Should I be spending this time going back to my primary career, contributing to that? So these questions keep plaguing you. How do you keep your interests alive? How do you stoke those embers over and over? I understood the true meaning of the word grit. Resilience and passion are two sides to the coin of grit. If you do not have passion, you cannot show up on your resilience. And if you do not have resilience, you cannot pursue your passion over a period of time. It is important to develop resilience. And as writing emerged as a compelling dream for me, I started developing resilience to it. But sometimes, this whole no rebu rebuke, no reward, wars with our innate need for some recognition, for some appreciation, some encouragement. It gnaws at your resilience. So once I figured that, I started using the blogging platform. I started sharing my work with my family and friends and the occasional stranger that, I, that would stumble upon it. And their comments, you know, both positive and negative, fueled me to keep going. And I use this as a temporary mechanism to sort of tide over to a more spiritual approach towards my secondary passion. I started looking at it with a sense of equanimity. You know, no longer connected to the result, but more towards the journey, enjoying the journey. My resilience became connected to the process and not the result. Whether I published or not, whether somebody said they liked it or not, I kept going back to my writing. And it actually helped me from being resentful or stressed out when things did not go the way I wanted it to go. So much so that I now feel more than the skills that I acquired as part of pursuing the secondary career, it is actually the attitude that I've acquired that has made me a better person. So in conclusion, expose yourself to a new element. It's okay to pursue multiple passions at the same time. Do it wisely, do it with grit, and do it just for yourself. Who knows, maybe what you learn in the football field today would help you design a better 3D algorithm for printing. And what you learn in your math class might come in handy to make better music. Even if not, it's okay. Because the journey itself is worth pursuing. Thank you.